Greetings, folks, and welcome to what for most or maybe even all of you is likely to be your first venture into the really interesting world of classical Chinese philosophy. What I plan to do with this little introduction is rather than just introduce you to Mengzi, who's the thinker that we'll be studying in this part of the unit, give you some background, some context into the world in which he's working. I do this because, of course, most people in this part of the world know little or nothing about the culture and politics and thought systems of ancient China. And as we only have one week to delve into this, the only way I think you can really appreciate it is to have some sense of the context into which, or at which rather, the work is directed. So. As we go forward through the next few slides, I'll just be giving you a quick history, really, of ancient China, focusing on developments relevant to the philosophic tradition, which of course will necessarily also revolve around the political tradition. I hope you find it interesting. It's a fascinating world, and one that has a lot to offer people who are approaching it from outside and haven't been raised with its presuppositions. That is, it offers us a really, really interesting position, a really interesting set of positions, rather, from which to, well, into which to climb, and then from which to turn back and look at our own culture. So that will be my intent in this unit. That's, that's the trajectory I plan to follow. But first, I really need to get you situated and give you some idea of where we're going. So, consider the following lecture to be something in the nature of an intellectual travel brochure. I hope you enjoy it. Of the so-called old world's major thought systems, by which term I include both religions and philosophies, those originating in ancient China developed in the greatest isolation and therefore stand at the greatest cognitive distance from the thought systems emanating from the so-called West. The reason for this isolation is largely geographic. As the society in the Yangtze Valley, the last of the major so-called cradles of civilization to emerge from the Neolithic, is separated from the next nearest center in India, not only by vast distance, but also by the world's highest mountain range, and by other very difficult terrain, much of which was occupied by other peoples, of course, by Han reckoning, that is, by ethnic Chinese reckoning, the Western and Southern barbarians, and yes, there were also Northern and Eastern barbarians too. So, while the Egyptians and Sumerians were busy inventing the first cities and writing systems, and while the Indo-Europeans were moving steadily north and west into Europe and south and east into Persia and India, developing into societies that would give us Hinduism and ultimately Buddhism at one end of the range, and the foundations of the Arthurian mythos in Ragnarok at the other end. While various Semitic peoples were thriving in what we call the Middle East and, and inventing monotheism in one group, the Hebrews, and in another, the Phoenicians trading goods, ideas, and alphabets with the Indo-Europeans and Greek to form the roots of Hellenism, and while Alexander the Great was busy bringing conquest and trade and a mixing of ideas and worldviews to Greece, Egypt, Persia, and India, the Han were left pretty much to themselves. Indo-European epic heroes such as Achilles, Beowulf, Cuchulain, Arjuna have no cousins east of the Himalayas. So when, about a thousand years after the Egyptians and Sumerians, the peoples of the Yangtze River Valley made the technological leap from Stone Age to Bronze Age, their nascent high culture was pretty much the only game in town. For our purposes, a fairly brief sketch of early Chinese history and thought should be sufficient. It begins, as most cultures do, with a mythical foundation. What relation this foundation myth bears to reality is unclear, but in the matter of philosophy, the question is not important, as all thinkers from the early period take its historicity as a given and appeal to its various figures in support of the ideas they put forward. The first such figure is the Yellow Emperor Huang Di, said to have first unified the Han under a stable and virtuous rule, 
and initiated the cultural forms and rituals that, though they changed, formed a continuity in Chinese history that lasted until 1905, until the early 20th century. In the legendary histories, Huangdi is placed in the 27th century BCE. Many thinkers refer to him as the ideal ruler and his reign as a sort of golden age. Most cultures do have a golden age somewhere in their mythical history. Next in line of mythical succession are the emperors Yao, Shun, and Yu, placed in the 24th to 22nd centuries BCE. The realm Yao inherited had fallen into vice and chaos, or so the story goes, as a result of the ancient rites having been abandoned. Crime, corruption, and suffering were rampant, and civilization on the verge of self-destruction. Yao, however, was particularly scrupulous in his choice of ministers, and equally scrupulous in his observation of ritual, and through these and other measures, succeeded in drawing his society back from the brink of collapse. His rule, as one might expect, was long and prosperous. But over the years, he came to see that his son was not the best person to take over from him. So instead of passing the throne on to Kin, he selected Shun, a wise and gifted minister of peasant stock, as his heir, and, recognizing as well that his energies were flagging, abdicated in Shun's favor rather than maintaining his position until death, as most monarchs commonly do. Significantly, this decision reflected the people's preference, thus establishing from an early date a link between the will of the populace and the legitimacy of the regime. Shun and Yu followed the same pattern. These three, then, are important not just for their capabilities as rulers, but also for their commitment to placing the good of the realm above the interests of themselves or their families. Moreover, they are also idealized for their adherence to the rituals that connected their own time to the deep past and their founding ancestors. Traditionally dated to around 2205 BCE, the legendary Xia dynasty is the first in a long line of ruling dynasties in Chinese history, though in this case the word history is a bit of an exaggeration, as no records from the period survive. Their putative founder, Fu Shi, might best be thought of as a mythic culture hero, as he receives credit for inventing the characters used in divination, which themselves go on to influence the characters used in the Chinese writing system. During the Shah as well, the Han perfected the potter's wheel and domesticated several types of animal, including pigs, dogs, oxen, goats, and sheep. They had a quite successful agricultural society, actually, though not a very large population, and also developed a complex system of irrigation canals to control the seasonal flooding. It's also in this period that the first cities in China arise. I should at this point say something about the writing systems that I'm using, because I'm using two. You'll see that Xia is written two ways at the top of the slide. H-S-I-A, and then in brackets X-I-A. Those make the same sounds. There are different ways of romanizing Chinese, of rendering the sounds of the various Chinese languages into the Roman alphabet. The two most common systems are the Wei Giles system, which was developed in the Victorian period, and the Pinyin system, which was developed probably about 80 or 90 years ago. Up until recently, the Wade-Giles system had been the most common in the West. This is the one that I'm not rendering in brackets. But increasingly over the last few decades, Western editors have been adopting the Pinyin system as well. And it is the Pinyin system that China uses as its official romanization system. The text we're using uses Pinyin as well. I'm just giving you both so that if you, in your adventures elsewhere, encounter one or another spelling of whichever name, period, dynasty, or character we're discussing, you'll have some idea of what you're looking at. With the next dynasty, the Shang, who ruled from about 1766 to 1121 BCE, we enter the period for which actual historical records survive. We also enter the Bronze Age, as the technology for bronze smelting was developed early in the period. The Shang originated in the Yangtze Valley, and their rule introduced several important 
innovations in addition to bronze smelting, namely the domestication of water buffalo and several species of bird, the composite bow, various advances in metalwork and ceramic art, and perhaps most importantly, a logocentric method of writing that would develop into the system that the Chinese still employ. By logocentric, I mean pictographic. It's not a phonetic system, but the letters or symbols stand for particular things or particular ideas. The Han under the Shang were also arguably the first people to develop a form of monotheism. As in the West, this form of religion made itself useful to the rulers, who saw in it a means of rooting their power in a supposed supernatural or transcendent authority. Thus, after a few centuries of the type of corruption that tends to follow from close church-state entanglement, the Han also became the first people in history to reject monotheism in favor of a more humanistic understanding of the world. It's this move toward humanism that defines, in many ways, virtually all Chinese philosophy. The engineers of this shift toward humanism, which didn't happen all at once, were the Zhou dynasty who held the throne from 1121 to about 255 BCE, though their rule is broken up into two periods, the Eastern and Western Zhou. The Western Zhou, the first period, ends in 771 BCE. In any case, the early Zhou rulers, having ousted the Shang and cultivated an upsurge in useful technology, needed to develop as well a counter to the Shang's metaphysical claim to power. The answers that thinkers under the Western Zhou came up with was the mandate of heaven, Tianming, a concept that would dominate Chinese political thought for almost 3,000 years. Given the importance of the term, it should probably be clarified. The understandings of both humanism and heaven, Tian, that emerge under the Zhou are quite different from their most well-known Western counterparts. The humanism underlying virtually all Chinese philosophy entails a unity of earth and heaven, both of which are governed by natural laws. That is, heaven is simply another facet of the cosmos that all living things inhabit, not a transcendent state of being. The cosmos is, in other words, in principle knowable through human mechanisms of knowledge. More importantly, heaven, as it gradually came to be understood, has no conscious volition and is not guided by a supreme being, or in fact a being of any kind. There is no supreme God, and thus no divine will. And yet heaven exerts an influence on human affairs, largely through the placement and removal of its mandate. A rough understanding of this notion might go something as follows. Heaven, earth, and human nature are all rational and interconnected. Ethics are also rational, and thus also connected to heaven and earth. Proper ethical behavior is thus a proper alignment of oneself with the principles that govern heaven, earth, and human nature. Political legitimacy rests in exactly such an alignment. Therefore, an unethical political regime has no legitimacy and can be overthrown if it fails after repeated and principled remonstrations to correct its ethical vices. The mandate of heaven arises then not as a function of supernatural will, but rather as a natural and thus rational consequence of human ethical conduct, an effect of the continuity of heaven and earth. If, for example, a dynasty becomes corrupt and the corruption is not corrected over a few generations, the dynasty loses the mandate of heaven, opening the door for another dynasty with a better, more ethical vision to step into the moral vacuum and, as the new bearers of the mandate, overthrow the failing regime without incurring the moral costs of treason or regicide. Meanwhile, the emperor, as bearer of the mandate and personal link between heaven and earth, comes to be known as the son of heaven, and the symbol for king, Wang, is very interesting in this context. It consists of three horizontal lines, representing heaven at the top, humanity in the middle, and earth on the bottom, and one vertical line standing for the king, who unites all three. And there, you've just learned your first Chinese character. The Eastern Zhou, whose dates are 770 to about 255 BCE, although you sometimes see 249 and sometimes 221, is named for the relocation of the capital from Tsengzhou in the west 
to Chengzhou in the east after the former was sacked. The Eastern Zhou contains two major periods, the Spring and Autumn and the Warring States periods. The Spring and Autumn period runs from 770 to 481 BCE, and the Warring States from 480 to 221. The Spring and Autumn period is marked by a waning in the power of the throne in comparison to that of the lords in the major feudal domains, and latterly a number of powerful functionaries as well. The decline of central power saw the establishment of many quasi-independent states. At any given time, the ruler of the most powerful state might bear the title of Ba, which translates as hegemon, and was conferred by the emperor as a formality, and as such would be responsible for the protection of the weaker states and the defense of the realm as a whole. In effect, if not actually in title, the hegemon becomes the de facto ruler of the empire. During this period, rivalries between the most powerful states became intense, as competing nobles jockeyed for top position, and ultimately, the facade of imperial order crumbled. The collapse of any viable pretense of central power at the end of the Spring and Autumn period led to the most dynamic two and a half centuries in Chinese history, the Warring States period. To put things in chronological perspective, depending on the source you check and the accuracy of any given source, Confucius, or Kung Fu Tzu, died either shortly before or shortly after the beginning of this period, and the shadowy figure Lao Tzu, who's credited with writing the Tao Te Ching, but who probably didn't actually exist, made his mythical departure for the West, which is to say India, around this time, where he was credited in Chinese tradition with introducing Taoism to India, where it turned into Buddhism. This is historically inaccurate, by the way. It's simply part of the tradition. In any case, during this period as well, the foundational thinkers in all of the indigenous Chinese philosophic traditions flourished. It's also therefore referred to as the Classical Period and the Period of the Hundred Schools. Of course, as with many pre-modern cultures, numbers here are not to be taken literally. It may be worth pointing out that a common term for the material world is the world of the 10,000 things. Exactly how many schools of thought flourished at this time is unknown, as most of the records have been lost. A brief sketch of a few of the most important schools follows. But before getting into our rundown of the major schools of thought, it might be useful to also name the other major thinkers from the Warring States period. As I just said, Confucius and Lao Tzu predate the period just barely. So in chronological order, we have Motsu, somewhere in the 400s BCE, the founder of the school of thought known as Moism. Yangju, somewhere in the 300s BC, the founder of a school known as Egoism. Mengzi, Mencius, our guy, whose dates are 372 to 289 BCE. He was a Confucian. Zhuangzi, from 350 to 299 BCE. He was, after Lao Tzu, the most important thinker in the Taoist tradition. Unlike Lao Tzu, he definitely did exist. Shanzi, who lived from 350 to 250 BCE, roughly, and he was also Confucian. And Han Feizi, whose birth date we don't know, but who died around 233 BCE. He was one of the more important thinkers in what's called the legalist school of thought. Anyways, you'll get to know these folks a little bit over the rest of the lecture. And, of course, you'll get to know Mengzi very well over the next week. But let's return from our little dating digression, shall we? First, of course, Confucianism. The notion of understanding Chinese thought and culture without understanding the work and influence of Confucius is a contradiction in terms. No thinker has exercised as much influence over Chinese culture or East Asian culture in general as he has, to the extent that in all honesty, I don't think the West offers a useful comparison. If we're comparing philosophers, I might suggest Socrates. If we're comparing religious figures, I might suggest Jesus. But the split between philosophy and religion is foreign to the roots of Chinese thought. And as far as I can see, history offers no single person to compare with Confucius. <laughs>
The impetus for much of his thought is clear from even a basic understanding of the times in which he lived. A time of visible and rapid social disintegration, military instability both at the borders and within the empire, and with real power no longer resting with a strong and capable leader, but rather constantly being squabbled over by ambitious dukes and greedy functionaries. In this political chaos, Kung Fu Tzu believed he also saw the decay of general ethics in terms of both relations among individuals and the hierarchical relations that defined the state in its proper functioning. Much of what he says, therefore, needs to be read against the backdrop of ongoing social decay. His emphasis on ritual, on stability, on orderly behavior, and the maintenance of inherited practices is therefore not, as can strike many Western readers, merely an argument for stasis. It's an attempt to stem a very real flood of social and political disaster that, by the end of his life, had erupted into the Warring States period. As with Socrates, during Confucius's life, his method was not well received. He was never invited to drink to his own eternal silence, as was our dear friend Socrates, but there is a story of at least one assassination attempt. That being said, by the end of his days, and after several minor bureaucratic posts, he gathered a large group of students around him, some of whom would themselves go on to influence Chinese life and politics for the better. He sustained himself by accepting payment from those who could afford it, but given his own ideas of human worth, it's not surprising that he also taught a great many poor students for free. As for what he taught, I don't want to say too much here, as you should be free to discover that for yourselves, but there are certain virtues and terms that take on special meaning under Master Kong. And these virtues and terms largely determine much of what will follow, both philosophically and socially. The most important of these is Ren. The term allows for a wide range of translations, humanity, benevolence, love. But the use established in the Analects, which is the work that records Confucius's thought, falls most closely, I think, to humanity, although benevolence is also in the running. In fact, the character for Ren is a compound of two simple characters, which you can see on the slide. The first one, also pronounced Ren, means human and depicts a pair of legs walking, therefore indicating the active nature of being human in the world, while the second element simply means two. That's the Chinese number two. The ideogram for the virtue Ren, therefore, indicates the activity of being human in relation to other humans. Confucius's use of the term as the central virtue of ethical philosophy is one of his most important innovations. The other innovation I'll mention here is the twist he puts on the term Junzi, or gentleman. The change is precisely analogous to the change that English terms for gentleman or noble or other European terms for gentleman or noble undergo in the later Middle Ages. That is, Confucius inherits a term that means simply a person of aristocratic birth and transforms it into a term indicating a person of highly cultivated ethical standards. He transplants a social term into the ethical realm and thus explicitly leaves open the possibility, on the one hand, that anyone, regardless of birth, has the potential to be a junsu, a gentleman, and on the other hand, that aristocratic birth is no guarantee of moral virtue. The two most important Confucian thinkers after Kong Tzu, as you may remember from my little name-dropping slide, are Meng Tzu and Shun Tzu, the former of whose names has been Latinized to Mencius. Master Meng, and Tzu, by the way, is an honorific, it simply means master, saw human nature as essentially good and therefore advocated for a less authoritarian relationship between government and people. Actually, you find in Mencius the roots of an argument whose conclusion leads strongly toward human rights, and we'll be talking about that in class. Since the 12th century, Mencius has come to be seen as the second sage of Confucianism after Confucius himself, and his interpretation and expansion of, of Master Kong's ideas inform all Neo-Confucian thought. 
which is a school of thought that dates back to about the 11th or 12th century. More recently, it's worth bearing in mind that Zhang Pengchun, vice chair of the draft committee for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was, among other accomplishments, an expert in the Menchian strain of Confucianism. That is, he was in many ways a follower of Meng Tzu. In his own time, though, Meng Tzu did not meet with much practical success, his arguments being overshadowed by his much younger contemporary, they overlapped by about two years, Shun Tzu. Shun Tzu's position was that human beings are essentially bad-natured, by which he meant selfishly driven by desires and aversions in a sense that really foreshadows much of the thinking of the first Western political scientist Thomas Hobbes. And therefore, from Shun Tzu's point of view, strict laws are needed to keep these desires and aversions under control. Shun Tzu also advocated systematic skepticism in all matters, demanding material proof before accepting any set of assertions. In this sense, his thought comes close to that of the early scientific revolution in the West. And I often suspect, with more than a little melancholy, that had Chinese political history played out a little differently, the scientific revolution might have gotten off the ground almost 2,000 years before it did. The other indigenous school of thought central to Chinese culture is Taoism. One of the few major world thought systems with roots sunk deep in the pre-agrarian Neolithic world, with clear ties to the shamanism still shared in various forms in the circumpolar region and with reflexes and remnants reaching far southward in both Asia and the Americas. And just to head off any misconceptions, this is not to equate Taoism with all these other practices, but simply to point to some common ground. There are, of course, many, many important differences. The word Tao in Chinese means, in its most literal sense, way, path, or road, and all schools of Chinese philosophy use the term. In Confucianism, it means not so much path as method or mode of living. That is, the way of the Confucian sage is to live sincerely according to certain virtues, rituals, and relationships. In Taoism, however, the word means something entirely different and all-encompassing, as both logically and temporally it precedes all existence. As it also necessarily precedes language, speaking about it accurately or completely is a priori impossible. As words can only ever exist within the way, they can never be made to contain or define it. The way even precedes such dualities as being, or you in Chinese, and non-being, or wu in Chinese, and, on the other hand, self and other. Therefore, much of the writing of both Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu attempts the impossible in trying to illustrate through words that which can't be illustrated through words. If you ever go on to read the Tao Te Ching, which I expect some of you may, and Zhuang Tzu, which I actually prefer, this understanding will help you understand some of the more challenging passages in both of those books. Regarding technical terms, the most important for our purposes where Taoism is concerned is Wu Wei, which is generally translated as non-action, but might better be rendered as David Hinton does as nothing's own doing. The reason for this seemingly awkward rendering is that non-action, as it has often been interpreted in the West, for example in the best-selling Tao of Pooh, is as a laid-back sort of hippie state of mind just watching the world pass by with an absence of perturbation. Rather than Winnie the Pooh, though, perhaps the best exemplar of Wu Wei is Bruce Lee. Non-action in this sense is not the absence of doing, but rather the absence of self-conscious effort. The ability to have so perfected some facet of one's being that it flows seemingly without volition in spontaneous response to one's surroundings. Another example might be a master musician, or quite frankly the master of any craft, who has so internalized his or her instrument or tools that they seem to become an extension of the individual's body and will. In reaching this degree of excellence, the individual paradoxically eliminates his or her ego consciousness and boundaries, and becomes in effect simply another living part of the living world.
It's these features, which are superficially compatible with Buddhism, that led on the one hand to the ease with which Buddhism later made inroads into China, and on the other to the comfortable fusion of Buddhism and Taoism that would ultimately result in Zen Buddhism, or Chan in Chinese. I bring this up specifically in our case. During Mencius's time, though, the most serious challenges to Confucianism, or to the way of the Confucian sage, or to the way of Confucius, were Moism and Egoism. So I'll address those next. The exact dates of the founding thinker of Moism, Mozi, are not known, but he seems to have lived during the 5th century BCE, and thus to have preceded Mengzi, but to have postdated Confucius. Though he's not someone we'll be looking at, he's worth mentioning for three reasons. One is that he demanded what was, for his time, a high standard of proof, coming close to empiricism, before accepting any assertion and advocated a stance of perpetual and unbiased skepticism toward both other people's ideas and one's own, an approach that would later be adopted and expanded, as I've mentioned, by the Confucian philosopher Shun Tzu. The second is that the central assertion in his doctrine was an attitude of universal and undifferentiated love or regard or benevolence toward one's fellow humans. And though this school of thought died out shortly after the Warring States period came to an end, it was one of the most popular of the so-called Hundred Schools. The third reason for mentioning Moism here is that Mencius goes to great lengths to refute it, and we'll be taking a look at some of his refutations. Opposite to Moism and opposite to Mo Tzu is the school of thought known as Egoism represented by Yang Zhu. Unfortunately, None of Yang Zhu's actual records or thoughts survive, so we only have any knowledge of egoism through sources that are hostile to it, including Mencius. So I'm not going to say too much about it here, except to say that whereas Mozu emphasized undifferentiated love or regard or benevolence to everyone, Yang Zhu went in the exact opposite direction and argued for absolute self-interest. But because his work doesn't exist, I hesitate to say too much about him because I don't want to represent him unfairly. The last school of thought I'll mention here is legalism, a doctrine put forward but not invented by Han Feitzu, who was actually a student of Shan Tzu and picked up on his teacher's two principal arguments, the badness of human nature and the need for strong laws, proposing that there was no good beyond the law and that the role of government was to maintain law and order, and the role of the subject was simply to obey the laws that the government maintained. Given the end of maintaining order, all means were open to the government, and as the best means of controlling subjects' behavior was to control their thoughts, the government was also permitted to control the flow of knowledge. It was this philosophy that the Qin adopted during their rise to power at the end of the Warring States period, and it was this philosophy that became the only authorized school of thought once the Qin had reunified the empire. Using the arguments of Han Feitzu as their justification, the Qin collected and burned as much history and philosophy as they could find, including the works of Confucius himself, in an attempt to stamp out any understanding but what they wanted the people to hold. And if their dynasty had lasted for more than one generation, most of what now survives might well have been lost as well. As it turns out, though, when the Qin were displaced by the Han in 209 BCE, the strict but more humane Confucianism of Shun Tzu came out as the dominant political philosophy, and the official destruction of knowledge effectively came to an end. What also must now come to an end is this little talk. I realize I've thrown quite a lot at you, and a lot that goes way outside the book we'll be reading. I've simply been going on the assumption that, like most people who've grown up in the West, you simply aren't aware of much about the context in which Mencius or Mengzi is writing. And without that context, I don't think it's possible to really appreciate the text. In any case, I hope you did find it interesting. And I think I'd like to just wrap up with an offer I make every time I teach any Chinese philosophy. And that is...
whereas St. Thomas University offers many excellent courses on Western philosophy, it doesn't offer any on Chinese philosophy. And this is an area that I've spent, honestly, the last 30 plus 35 years or so reading about just on my own time. So if anybody is interested in pursuing this further, informally, of course, after this unit's done, I'd be more than happy to recommend reading or answer any questions or, um, or just have a conversation with you. It's a fascinating field and, and one that's increasingly getting more attention in Western academic circles. No doubt because the fortunes of China are currently on the rise and it's probably a good idea to have a better understanding of that part of the world than most people in the West currently do. Anyways, I look forward to talking to you soon, and I do hope you find this an interesting unit. Bye for now.